funny thing I could actually see. Okay, I think, wait, I think this should work. Let's try this. Okay, I think it's working. <laughs> I have no idea why it didn't work the first time, but now we should be on YouTube. I think we're all set. Works for me too. Yep, okay, thanks, we're good. Thanks, I'll okay. pop off, message me if, or email me. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. So oh, wait, sorry for the make you host. <gasps> yeah, 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 make me host. You go. <laughs> so sorry everyone for the delay and the technical issues. Not entirely clear what went wrong there, but um, but uh, we're now live on YouTube and over uh, over Zoom. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Susanna Yellen. Um, so Susanna is a, a physics professor at Harvard University. She's a, a quantum optics theorist who specializes in. Uh, cooperative phenomena, coherence, nonlinear optics, things like superradiance. Um, and uh, she's uh, received a number of recognitions and accolades, including she's a fellow of Optica, fellow of the APS, and also a recipient of the Willis Lamb Award for Laser Science and Quantum Optics. Uh, and also, uh, I know personally from my wife that she plays Amin Shostakovich on the violin. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce you. We're looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you so much. Um, I have to say, um, um, being at Harvard, apparently they, they don't need to have such a secure internet. So once in a while, my Zoom just says goodbye. In that case, I will just log back in. So, oops, don't give up on me, I'm sorry. Um, I will share now. Okay, all right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me, giving me this um, this opportunity. Um, let me start this by um, by introducing my collaborators because one always ends up um, um, with with not not enough time for that. So these are the people who actually did the work. Um, um, Effie and Rivka are former postdocs who have both positions now um, at, 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 very, at uh, the faculty positions. Um, um, Stefan is a um, postdoc at the moment, and the other three are, uh, three are graduate students. And everybody else who was in one way or another involved in this work is listed at the bottom. And of course, I also want to thank the AFOSR, NSF, DOE, and ARO to give money to the various projects. Um, I need to, sorry. Okay, um, so the goals um, of, of the work that I'm going to talk about today um, are to use a 2D array. So here, these little blue bubbles um, are all supposed to be um, two-level atoms, unless I say differently. Um, and um, it could be also any other um, any other dipoles, excitons, or nanoparticles, or something like that. But but if, if for now, just imagine they are two level atoms, and this can be used to reflect light, frequency selective, um, to answer this age old question: How can we increase the a single atom, single photon cross section? from about lambda squared to something macroscopic, where macroscopic, of course, means in this case, the size of the array, and how to um, make um, quantum gates or some kind of a quantum network on array using impurities in such arrays. This particular setup also leads to potential applications in metrology um, for um, for some topological um, physics with photonic edge states. And also we are looking a little bit deeper into chirality um, in, in systems like that. And then finally, I would like to show you how to manipulate photons and create to, how to create a quantum mirror. Um, probably I will not get to all of it, so, so I... Um, um, depends a little bit, but but um, and I will not probably talk about this. So um, 
what, what is it about quantum optics which with atomically thin materials? So first of all, obviously, as in quantum optics, we always want to have a very strong optical response um, that can be engineered. And ideally, there are also guided modes can be constructed, um, for example, waveguides for topological ph phenomena. And um, in a sense, that works very similar to, to matter materials. And so um, atomic matter surfaces is a good kind of name to give this. So let me start by giving you an idea about the, the, what is the original setup and how does it work? What would we expect from such a system? So we have an array of atoms where the lattice constant is of the order of the um, resonant wavelengths, um, a little bit smaller. And the question is, as you can see here, I have these little circles around these, um, with the natural cross-section of, of atoms being of the, of the order of lambda squared, we would expect this A um, lattice constant roughly being equal to the wavelengths um, be the region where, where the atoms basically tile the plane. Please do note that despite that, um, of course, this is compared to a regular mirror or a regular solid, a very, very um, dilute system. Um, so the question is, if they tile the plane, can one actually get complete re reflection um, from, from such a system? And the answer is yes. Um, that's not very surprising. What is somewhat surprising is the fact that this happens for a ratio of A over lambda of 0 0.2 or 0 0.8 um, if we have a, have a perfect square lattice. And um, this intrigued us enough that we looked into that. And please do note there, there was a, some numerical work by, by the groups of, group of Charles Adam, which came a little bit before. Um, and here is a picture of, of how this could look like in, in real life if you actually send some light in. So the first thing that I would like to, to emphasize here is that if we have a lattice constant that's somewhat smaller than the wavelengths, we have to take cooperativity into account, um, which means in this particular case, dipole-dipole interaction. And of course, the, the, the two-level systems in the ground state or in the excited states don't have a dipole moment, so they don't interact. But the transition element, the, the rho eg element um, does interact, and so we get flip-flop interaction. And this leads to a total nonlinearity in the system. And this is at the basis of the physics that, it, that I'm going to talk about now. So let's first look at, at the very, very simplest mathematical model of, of this reflectivity. <clears throat> So here we look at a field that, that comes out um, away from, the, from this um, uh, surface um, as a function of the incoming one, which we just look here, um, a model as, a, as plane waves, which propagate in the z direction, while our array is supposed to be infinitely big in the xy plane. And then we get scattering, which goes in both direction in the z direction and has a scattering constant s. And um, as one can see from the simple equation that if s is equal to minus one, we get full reflection because the forward direction plus z direction um, gets uh, interferes destructively and nothing will get through. <clears throat> so that means our this, this physics problem of of why does do we get this mirroring um, is now reduced to well let's just cal calculate the scattering constant and let's see where that becomes minus one. So here is the solution for that. Um, as we can see, we get the scattering constant that has the usual Lorentzian form um, with gamma and and delta plus i gamma uh, basically in the in the denominator um, um, only that now our normal gamma, which is the line width of our two-level system, has an additional term gamma collective and the detuning, which is the detuning between the, the uh, resonance and the incoming light, 
has another term which we call Delta Collective. And this Gamma Collective and Delta Collective are respective the real and imaginary part of the dipolar interaction between each pair of atoms or radiators in this array. So this is basically the, where the cooperative effects come in. So this is exactly where, um, 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 where we see that. And now we can look back at what, what we set out to see, namely where is S equals to minus one. And this is very simple. This is just where this total sum of, of the tunings that we get here is zero. And this one we can um, plot. Um, and because it depends whether we get reflection depends only on the delta. Um, I just plot here delta collective and you see A over lambda on the x-axis. And the delta um, um, on the y-axis, and here is the zero line where we don't get any any um, any shift. And um, if we have um, if we send in light on resonance, then we want this delta collective equal to zero for s equals to minus one and for full reflection. And if we look at where these crossing points are between zero and the and the function here. We see that this happens actually indeed exactly at 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. Um, this also fortunately immediately tells us how we can make the system a little bit more versatile um, because we can now, of course, send in some light with a little bit of the tuning and find that our crossing points are now at a little bit different A over lambda, so at different frequencies. And here on the right side on the bottom, we see the reflection coefficient. Um, uh, the, the yellow one is, is the one on resonance and all the other ones are the ones um, where we have the tuned light and we see that we can pretty much tune anywhere for A smaller than lambda. And um, perhaps let me, let me go three slides further and then, then I open up for a couple of questions. So the first thing I would like to say is I showed you the number for a square lattice but this works for any regular lattice, for example, triangular, Kagome, um, honeycomb, only it's not 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, it's a little bit other numbers, but all the physics qualitatively, otherwise it's exactly the same. So this, this reflectivity using a somewhat dilute set of atoms as a mirror and potentially a perfect mirror is the first property of a system like that. The second property can be seen if one looks at the band structure of this. So here we see in the three different colors, the three different light polarization, the, the purple um, um, broken line is a circular polarization. And the brillion zone is here, the inside and the, and the right center um, for, for a square lattice. And what we find is that for small K values, namely up to the dotted lines, um, which we call within the light cone, um, the K, the wave number um, on the surface is smaller than the wave number of the light in vacuum. So with K equals square root of Kx squared plus Ky squared plus Kz squared, that tells us that it's easy to couple to the vacuum, it's all allowed, and we can get emission from the surface. If we, however, go outside of the, life, uh, of the light cone, the k value is larger. The k value of kx squared plus ky squared square root is larger than the total k value in vacuum. And so there is no way that, that a connection between um, the surface and the vacuum is allowed. So if we manage to capture some excitations on the surface, um, it will stay in principle forever on the surface. And of course, the, the idea is to now use the, this, this wave guiding um, idea and, the, and this reflectivity um, to manipulate and play around with the system. And that's what all the applications will be about. But um, I will make a break at this point um, to see whether there are some questions. Great. Yeah, there are a few questions. Um, so the first one here is, um, how much of this can be understood if you treated your atoms as purely classical dipole antennas and how much of it is quantum? Excellent question. And I would actually have said this, but you give me a, the, the perfect handle. 
what I told you so far is actually perfectly classical. There is so far absolutely nothing quantum about that other than if you want to call the fact that there's an atom a quantum, but this can be done completely classically and I will show you an example of that in a second. Um, the applications that I will show you are all quantum though. So there is a, an ex, there's always an extra element in there, but yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and then uh, another question is, is, is there an easy sort of physical explanation for why it's happens at this one fifth and, and four fifths of Lambda for a square lattice? No, there is not. Um, despite the fact that this was what kind of got us curious, um, which probably you can also figure from, from the fact that for, for other lattice forms, it is not quite as nice. Um, but as I said, um, this fact comes from adding up all the possible dipole-dipole interaction. And of course, now a square lattice is very symmetric and just allows for, for some of these infinite sums that are involved at the end in there um, to come out to, to straight numbers. But I think there's no good physical reason. It's um, As you can see from, from this picture that I had here, um, you always would get two solutions, which are somewhere between zero and one. But where exactly these two solutions are, I mean, at, at least if you if you if you detune not further than about half of a, a line width, um, where exactly that is depends on the on the particulars of the system. Um, a question from uh, Dima Budker, actually. Uh, so, what 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 assumptions are you making about the interactions between the atoms? So there are no direct interactions. There is only this flip-flop dipole-dipole interaction, and that's it. Um, um, okay, and maybe one one last question, and then we can move on. So if you wanted to make, say, like a spherical mirror or a parabolic reflector or something to focus the light, would it be possible? Um, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, so in principle, um, what you would need to do, you, you would need to have diffraction. And the way we have set this up right now is completely without diffraction. There is, however, an, a, a, so, so that means if you, would, if you have, would have some kind of curved surface um, that would just make this reflectivity or so a little bit worse. Um, but... Um, well, sorry, I, sh I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that. The, the point is, and and perhaps um, you can see this in the in this in this in this picture that I that I have here. Just a second. Um, 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 as you can see here, we still get the usual. The um, um, angle in is equal angle out. So yes, you can do this. Sorry, that's I, I should say this. We do get, um, as the bigger the angle is, the worse it gets. So it's not perfect anymore. Um, it turns, however, out that that for this 0 0.2 resonance, um, um, it gets considerably under 99% only for an angle that is somehow, I think, over 60 degrees from the normal. So yes, you can do this. Um, but um, but you really would have to do it in reflection and not in transmission. So, but but I think that was the question to start with. So, um, in principle, yes, you can do this. Um, but you shouldn't make the curvature too too big because at some point the curvature will take over, and we have not looked at this. Great. Okay, maybe we can um, move on for now and save the rest of the questions questions for okay. later. All right. Very good. So. The first thing, the first question that one could ask is how can one implement this in an experiment? So the very obvious um, answer here is, of course, atoms and optical lattices. That was, in fact, how we how we first um, it got the idea to even look at that um, because um, Markus Greiner, who was, of course, the, the first inventor of the quantum gas microscope, started building an accordion lattice. And I should say, I mean, by now, this, this should, of course, have a lot of references. Um, um, and and um, for example, there are by now a couple of experiments where people have seen that. The first was done in Emanuel Bloch's group. And so obviously, the, the, um, this can be done in optical lattices. Um, other options which might on the long run be more interesting is we find if we find a solid state um, situation. And um, the best 
um, seem to be the transition metal dichalcogenides, um, which I just copied out um, the Wikipedia picture in case you have never seen those. They look from above like graphene. They are in principle perfect single layer systems, only that every other graphene is, is replaced by two uh, dichalcogenides like sulfur selenide, which are the yellow, um, yellow blobs in this picture. And this is a perfect system because it's naturally 2D and it's also naturally an ordered system. And in fact, um, um, around the time when we when we had our first paper on this, um, there was a, an experiment by, by our colleagues, Hong Kong Park, Philip Kim, um, and actually at the same time in parallel by Ataj Imamoglu, who um, tried this out. And there were, of course, a couple of other questions in their paper, and I'm not going into details here. Um, here you see they used this, this molybdenum and selenide MOSI um, system. And the normal picture is on the left, where the, where the um, TMD is, is drawn in by hand, because if you shine light and you don't even see it, what you do see is the HPN surface and the platinum leads. On the right side, um, they hit the right resonance, and you can see that, that this now actually becomes um, visible. That means it becomes reflective. And um, so this is one option. Um, there are other options. Um, we are looking into whether one can do that with diamond color centers, etc. But one question that stays open is, can one go actually somewhere into higher frequency than visible? Because all of these things, of course, um, have, um, have resonances in the visible or somewhere thereabouts. So for that, we have to look back again at what do we actually need? First of all, we need a resonant wavelength um, that is actually of interest. So if we want something that, that can do UV or X-ray or something like that, we need a material that has some kind of transition or resonance in the UV or X-ray. And second, we need a lattice constant that is smaller or of the order of the wavelengths. Um, and um, well, as I just said, that means transition frequency of the radiators is not so easy. And we need to have the attainability of a small lattice constant, which of course, typically for a solid state is not that hard. Um, so we have been looking in, for example, nuclear transition in iron or something like that. We have so far not found the found the system where where the numbers quite work out. Um, but if you if you know some, please let me know. That's that's definitely still an open question. But another option um, is to, and here comes the question of classical in again, is to actually make a matter. Um, meta surface with, for example, nano gold spheres, which of course have a, have a, um, a dipole moment and with a frequency that actually does depend on the, on the plasma frequency, but is relatively broadband. So in principle, that should be working relatively well if we just want to make a mirror. So we looked at this. Um, um, and thought how we just try to put a couple of, of numbers in um, to see how well this works. Um, and much, much later, we found that there's actually somebody who works on this full time. This is Alejandro Manjavacas, who just moved actually from New Mexico to Madrid. Um, but if you are interested in that, please check out his work. Um, um, he, however, works at like, near infrared um, with, I think, silver spheres. What we wanted to do is we wanted, of course, to much smaller um, uh, wavelengths. So um, we calculated um, what would be the geometry, et cetera, and we found that the situation should look something like that. We have the spheres um, that in order to have the strong enough dipole moment in the right frequency would have to overlap. So obviously it doesn't work. And so we, um, we um, um, left this and just started revisiting that because nobody tells us that we have to use spheres. So if you actually go and do 
like little um, little ellipsoids, either oblate or prolate, um, you can, like on shown here on the right side, um, in principle, partially overlap this. And we tried out whether this works and whether, whether, whether the numbers work out. And we just looked into gold, silver, and aluminum. And interesting, in, interestingly enough, aluminum actually has the highest plasma frequency. So that works best if we want to really go to high frequency. And here are some, um, some um, preliminary results where we see that this transmission actually really still works. Please do note that um, the different colors here are for, for different angles of, of how, we, how we move our ellipsoids. And as you can see, this is for a square lattice, but the, but the, um, um, the full reflectivity um, resonance actually moves away from 0 0.2 into smaller A over lambda. Okay, um, let me just show a couple of applications. So there are a lot of applications and I've listed some here and I don't even want to, to read through all of them. So I go on right away and start with, um, what happens if we put an impurity on there? So again, the typical cross section of, of a um, lonely atom in space for a single um, resonant photon is of the order of lambda squared, which of course, if you want to do some kind of deterministic, whatever nonlinear physics with that or so, is, um, is, is, doesn't give us a very good probability. So. Let's put this this atom um, somehow embedded into an into an array and see whether we whether um, whether we can potentially make the cross section as big as the array. So I show you first um, first some results, and then I give you a kind of uh, what our thinking was, why we thought that works at all. So first. Um, let's look at the two at the two um, um, ingredients not put together. The impurity alone. So this is exactly this lonely atom in space with a with a um, Gaussian um, wave coming in, and and this also serves as the gauge for this the strength of the scattering. So with the near field effects, um, they, they are just called scattering intensity two, as you see on the, on the color bar. For the array, we get up to four because of constructive interference of this kind of standing wave that we get. And now let's put the two together, impurity and array. And in this case, we see immediately, oh, this changes a lot. Um, we get a lot stronger scattering. And I want to, in particular, for you to have a look at the color scale, which now is two orders of magnitude higher. So obviously, what happens is that indeed um, um, we can kind of collect a lot of radiation at the place where, where the impurity sits. So let me try to give you some a little bit of an intuition on this. <clears throat> so. There is, of course, a classical intuition because the dipoles act in principle like antenna arrays. It turns out, however, that this is a case where actually um, where this would classically not work anymore because antenna arrays have part but not all the properties that we need. So let's look at the quantum explanation. So for that, we need to go into the Brion zone anymore again. And um, it turns out that this whole effect works best if we are sitting somewhere just, just outside of the Brion zone. Uh, for example, where I kind of just put my, my little orange dot here. And if we are here, the, the, the light that we shine in, I'm um, sorry, this, this would be where, where um, the, the frequency of, the, of the, the wave number of the frequency of the impurity. And now we send in light that is somehow close to in, on resonance and even a little bit further outside um, um, than the impurity is. And in this case, the array can only be excited virtually. Um, it's the it's energy conservation doesn't allow to actually excite the array. And so whatever impinges on the array is still seen because it's still close enough, 
but it basically immediately all collects on the impurity. So this is basically what is going on in a case like that. And as far as I can, I, as I understand this, this is something which is purely classical. You cannot do this. Um, you cannot do this um, um, with, with class. It, it's purely quantum and you cannot do it classically. I'm sorry. So the next question is what if we have two um, qubits on the array and we want them to interact? So the easiest way of, of interaction is, is to just let them exchange population and see whether this is coherent. And the way this can be done is, let's assume we have one of these impurities excited and the other one in the ground state. And then we just look what happens in the time evolution. And um, in order to quantify that, we define a quality factor, which gives the ratio of how good is the coupling between the impurities versus the decay into space. And what one gets here is something that looks like Rabi oscillations. So here, um, the, the orange and the blue are the, the populations on the two impurities. And let me just go on two steps further. Um, obviously, there are situations where this works decently as on the top or really, really well on the bottom. And what we see on the right side is this quali quality factor um, in the SS dependent on parameters. And in particular, we see here A over lambda on the X axis and the detuning between the lattice and the impurity um, on the Y axis. And the, the quality factor is really high along this yellow line that we see here. Um, and here, uh, especially in the, in the lower case for which we changed a couple of things. I don't want to go into detail. We could get in principle quali quality factor for, um, um, for, for of up to the um, up to the 10 to the six in this case. And um, please do note in case you are interested in exactly the opposite effect somewhere where the where the, the impurity gets rid of their um, of their population extremely, extremely fast, namely 10 to the four, uh, four orders of magnitude faster, please um, sit somewhere on the blue line. Okay, so one more slide and I make another, another break. So obviously um, one can now um, think about kind of having an on array network of impurity qubits. Um, for this, we obviously need single and two qubit gates. And even for the single qubit gates, we need on off switch um, for the interaction with the, with the lattice. And the easiest way to do that is to use actually three level atoms and use EIT. And I'm not going into detail on this. Um, we have an upcoming paper on this. So, so keep your eyes open for this if you are interested. And with that, I make another break. Okay, great. We have a, a, a few different questions. So um, one question is, uh, for dipole-dipole interactions, uh, there should be corresponding frequency shifts. Is that is that yes. true? And, yes, yes. Uh, do they scale with, and if so, yeah. uh, they generally scale so, with... So this is, this, is, this is, so the dipole-dipole the interaction frequency shift, I mean, this is exactly this capital gamma, capital delta that I showed before. That's exactly um, the, the, the broadening um, and the shift. And uh, please do note that they also follow a, a grammar's chronic um, relation despite being, despite being nonlinear. Um, and yes, this is very important. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then for collective effects, um, you know, it, it's natural to, as you considered, to consider the wavelength regime, but is there anything interesting that happens if you go to larger spacings, maybe even in three dimensions instead of just two dimensions? Yes, um, what happens if you go to larger spacings, um, basically for every lambda that you add to A, um, you get an extra um, um, diffraction order. So, um, and this is why you don't get this perfect reflectivity anymore. You get still pretty good reflectivity, but you get the second diffraction order, which doesn't reflect uh, with a, a diffraction order, which reflects to somewhere else. So you never get 100%. And so, yes, if you are interested in something like that, for example, if you now would like to combine um, uh, this, this effect with, with somehow with Bragg reflection or so, you probably would, would kind of the best working point I would guess, I haven't tried this out, you would probably go between lambda and two lambda um, for the strongest effect. 
Um, okay, and then, so this is kind of an out there question. Um, wh what would happen if you tried the same thing with magnetic dipole transitions or with electric quadrupole transitions or something like that? How does it? Um, so at the end, of course, um, um, all of these, at, at least like magnetic dipole transition, of course, coupled to light the same as electric dipole tra transitions do. But of course, typically the magnetic dipole moments are a lot weaker. Mm -hmm. So that means that that at the end for this to work equally well, um, you um, what what I didn't say because this is a little bit more complicated, um, and actually this is also part of the last question. Both the gamma and the delta scale with a over uh, with lambda over a squared. Um, so um, that means that that in order to get a reasonably strong effect um, with relatively weak. Um, magnetic dipole transitions, um, you would have to probably just go to, for a, a smaller lattice constant. Um, I think, um, I don't know, I, I actually, I have to say, I don't know exactly how you couple two quadrupole transitions or so, or how that would scale. So my guess is um, uh, this goes in a similar direction as, as magnetic dipole transitions but i don't know exactly whether whether this is exactly true so um i would have to try this out if somebody has some kind of in, intelligent idea regarding that but um um this magnetic dipole transition it definitely of course also works um and then uh, maybe one last question and then we can move on so uh it it seems like so far uh you maybe haven't mentioned the polarization of the light does this yeah. work equally well for all polarizations does it matter at all or um, I mean, the polarization basically depends, um, um, has a connection with the, with the um, propagation direction, obviously, right? Because, mm -hmm. because the polarization is perpendicular to a a propagation direction. For atoms or spheres or something like that, um, that's the only, one, only thing that you have to take into account. And it actually turns out that even if you come very much at a very shallow angle, um, that usually the, every every reflect every reflection reflects basically into its own sector. So the polarization changes very very little. But of course, if you take um, radiators of a smaller symmetry, like for example the ellipsoids that I showed you before, the, the symmetry of the of the polarization will get also smaller. So the selection rules are not as good anymore. Um great. Okay. Well maybe we can let you uh, continue. Okay. So let me um here um this metrology application is based on this impurities that I showed before and actually has moderately much to do with exceptional points, but I don't want to go into these exceptional points. So I go directly into the next view graph. So here you see basically the same picture again that I showed you before. If you look at these black lines, um, um, they are basically the, the exchange of, of population between two impurities. Um, obviously not at such a perfect working point as I showed before. Um, and now what we do in order to get from the black lines to the blue and orange one is we tune, detune these, these, um, these two impurities very slightly from each other. And what you see is that um, um, the, the exchange of population doesn't happen perfectly anymore. And one can use that now as a kind of a measuring point. Namely, one looks at the maximum population that the that the the originally unpopulated impurity gets. This is this black point here, and that one you can then plot as a function of of frequency. And what you see is some line widths. The different colors again are different lattice constants. But the interesting part of that is that um, the the um, this is a this delta over lambda that I have on the x-axis is the detuning between the two um, impurities over the gamma, the line widths of the impurities. And as you can see, these lines that that form here 
are about of the order are about like like five orders of magnitude smaller than the actual line bits. So the question is, can one use that potentially as a new method of metrology? Now there are of course a lot of questions coming up. The first is how can one understand this better and so on. And I'm um, we are still kind of trying to figure that out, but I don't want to go into details of this. Here we just show that this doesn't have an a priori limit. So, so if we go smaller and smaller with the impurity line widths, we can in principle go smaller and smaller with this measuring line widths. Um, but it has to do basically with something which is akin to cavity QED. So we would call this array QED. So we have some similar mechanisms on an array that you would have an, an, um, in a cavity. And of course, this is metrology that is partic particularly interesting for really small distances. Um, for example, whatever micrometer gravity changes. I should say here that, of course, um, that means that your that your um, that your impurities are perfect, and that your lattice is perfect, and that the placement of the impurity is perfect, etc. But you can add, in principle, one step in between. Um, to gauge the system and then do the measurement on the gauge system. And this is something which we are working on right now. We did, I don't have results yet on, on how quickly that deteriorates, but it's not that if everything is not totally perfect, then you have to forget about this. Okay, so one more. Let's look at, at, at a little bit of topology. This is actually also a relatively old part of the system. Um, which which has had been studied already originally before we even started our array work. So the idea is the following. If you have a 2D honeycomb lattice of atoms, um, again with sub-wavelength spacing, <clears throat> which now we take three level atoms, which have somewhere a V-type transition um, pattern in there, such that you can... Um, that you can couple both um, sigma plus and sigma minus polarized light. Originally, this uh, delta that I put in here is, of course, um, zero. Um, but you can um, shift these two transitions against each other by, by putting an out-of-plane magnetic field. So what happens? Um, let's look at this band structure. So here is the band structure. This is... Um, um, a little bit similar as what we have before, um, but of course it's now a honeycomb band structure and this, this as such has a direct point, um, namely um, a, a point where, where, where two neighboring bands touch only on one point and otherwise we have two different bands. And as, for example, in, in um, spin quantum hall materials, if you now put the magnetic field and, and split this sigma plus and sigma minus transition, you change your band structure such that the band gap opens. And not only that, the neighboring bands um, also have a non-zero churn number. Um, and um, this opens our system for the possibility of edge states. So edge states are those states where you start some excitation somewhere on the on the system here we do that uh, on, in the right middle and just see how does this excitation now propagate through the medium and it actually um, has a directionality and cannot um, can basically move only in one direction and um, and therefore goes along the edge um, and as I say, that was an idea that people had before and that also worked before already. There are plenty of experiments um, on this. But um, what was new in this work is that um, if you use the same type of sub-wavelength band structure that, that gives this perfect wave guiding, as I showed you before, um, that is actually a very stable phenomenon because these this excitations, they cannot just kind of go off into free space. So um, coming from that, um, there is some, some kind of new question that we have. Can we actually go with this whole kind of handedness and helicity and carality about a, a step further? 
So this is what I what I kind of mentioned in the beginning, and let me start at the beginning of this particular question. So um, in biophysics, there is this um, people are much looking into the so-called cis effect or chiral induced spin selectivity effect. Um, I have um, a general reference given here from 1999. Um, and what that is means that chiral molecule act as an efficient spin filter for electrons. So um, here's a picture of that. And this is out of this um, somewhat later science paper um, where you send in unpolarized um, electrons on the bottom. They go through this kind of helical <coughs> molecules and are um, um, and they um, are having a stronger spin in one direction than in the other direction on, uh, upon coming out. So this um, made us wonder. A um, and this is so sorry. This made not only us wonder but also other people. Um, A is that the origin of homochirality in life, as you probably all know, life has um, in, in, in our bodies, there are a lot of chiral molecules and all of them are on the, of the same chirality. On the right is here a picture that, that demonstrates that. So here, this is not our paper. This is a paper came on the archive for a couple of, a couple of months ago where they kind of look how likely is this to, to be actually responsible for, um, for, for life. The fact that there is this, con uh, this connection between chirality selection and electron polarization. So this question came up because there were findings in meteoroids that, um, that show some, also some preferential chirality of kind of medium-sized chiral molecule with the same kind of chirality preference that life on Earth has, even though it's kind of as far as I know, proven that that this is a, these are meteorites that never had any connection somehow with Earth before. So um, now, of course, we do quantum optics, right? And so we are looking not so much at electrons, but more at light. And light is also, of course, um, omnipresent in the, uni in, in the universe. And so the question is, could the asymmetry in photon polarization, which some people find in parts of the universe, um, lead to this original asymmetry in the chirality? And of course, the next question would be, is there some way how to amplify this chirality, et cetera? That part we are not addressing. So the question is here um, more precisely, how could homochirality be broken using photons? And please do note that usually um, um, chirality breaking or, or, or somehow polarization breaking needs um, time reversal symmetry breaking. Like for example, you might remember the Faraday effect um, or or um, where, where you put a magnetic field and you can manipulate the, the polarization of your light. So we want to try this without a magnetic field. So here is, is our model and um, very similar to this original kind of electron experiment, we decided to start with a helical array of, of, of atoms or of, of radiators. Um, which are dipole dipole coupled. So the distance of these of these atoms again is supposed to be smaller than the wavelengths. Um, the atoms, like in the in the applications that I showed before, um, again are V-type such that they couple both to to um, to left and right so circularly polarized light. So how does that go? So we trap the atoms in a helical structure. Um, include the pseudo, what we call the pseudo spin um, degrees of freedom in a, a V level system. And then we transport, uh, we, we, we look at photon transport, um, for example, starting um, exciting the slowest, the slowest atom and see how this, how this, um, how this transport works. And um, um, if we sorry, if we get a high difference in transport for the, the, the left and right polarized light, that means um, that would show up in preferential population of the what what is here called pseudo spin up or pseudo spin down population uh, states. 
So let's look how, how that looks like. So what we get is there is indeed a difference. So um, this, this basically um, starts going up the helix and we can see that the, that the population of the right, um, polar, uh, right circularly polarized um, um, transition is larger and noticeably larger than the one for the left polarized. And please do note, um, because our, this, the, our size is finite, eventually there will be reflection and this thing goes the other way around. And kind of predictably, the, the, the preference kind of turns around as well. So apparently, there is indeed a chiral bias in the photon transport here. And <clears throat> the next step is looking also here at the band structure. And here we have the band structure. This is basically the same as, as we have seen before. Um, only that we also <coughs> have this color coded. So red is if the population is preferential in the red state, etc. And what we see from that is that we have in a system like that emergent spin orbit coupling without a magnetic field. This is just kind of given by this helical geometry. And it turns out that we actually, if we if we look at the right type of parameters, we also have a gap opening. Um, but we can see that so far. Um, actually, the gap always opens, but we can see non-zero germ numbers so far only for nearest neighbor interactions. This is still there for, for long-range interactions. This is still an open question. But anyway, um, it looks like fairly promising. The effect is still pretty small. Um, and of course, it's not 2D. So um, the next the next thing that we will look at, if we have answered all the open questions, is whether one can um, replace this helix by a, by a spiral in 2D. And I am like nearly 50 minutes in. I don't know. I would give either stop here, which I can happily do, or give time for questions. Shimon, you tell me. Um, I, so I, I think you can, uh, it's, it's up to you if you have anything else you wanted to cover. We started five minutes late, so you're welcome to, to go for another five minutes or so if you want, or we can do some questions totally up to you. Um, you know what? I I give you I give you one one more application, namely quantum matter surfaces. Um, this should be relatively fast, and this is also um, already kind of by now I think two years old or so. But it's a pretty cool application, and it has its first experiment done now, and so I like to to talk about this. So we have the same um, the same array as before. Um, but what if we now have a superposition of arrays um, where either every single um, atom in the array is in the ground state or every single atom in the array is in the excited state? Then we have a cat state of this. And let's see what would we expect with this quantum reflection that we looked at before. And I should probably not say quantum, even though the cat state is, of course, quantum, but this, whether it's reflections or, or trans, uh, transmitting. So obviously, the, the blue example, we would get full reflection because we set our parameters like that. But the, the excited state um, cannot hold any more ex, um, excitations, and therefore, this yellow lattice is completely transparent for the photons. So if we have the superposition, what we would get would be a superposition of a reflecting and a transmitting response of this atom. So at the end, um, this is the closest to how I would um, um, interpret a picture like that that can be found on the internet. So the question is, how can one produce such a superposition? And um, this can be done again with, with Rydberg or with EIT, which I mentioned before, electromagnetically induced transparency, um, where we have three states um, with two, with two um, um, coupling fields, um, the small red omega, um, which is the probe field, and the driving field, the blue capital omega. And what is important for EIT is that the, the two fields together are resonant with the G to R transition. And EIT means uh, there is transparency, which means that in this case, if both fields are on, this state E is not visible for the light at all, which means that, that basically this red transition goes into the empty, doesn't see the array, and therefore is transmitting. 
Alternatively, we could have the case where this Wittberg um, um, field is gone up here on the right side on the top, and the, the, it's not in two photon resonance anymore. If it's not in two photon resonance, this G to E transitions acts like before, and the field is um, gets reflected. So how do we get this um, in or out of resonance? And this is via dipole-dipole interaction of Wittberg atoms. So Wittberg atoms um, and dipole-dipole interact extremely strongly and leading to the so-called Wittberg blockade, which just means that if we have one excited Wittberg atom, every other Wittberg atom would so strongly interact with this one um, that that resonant excitation would actually not work anymore because the interaction moves this out of re resonance. So that means in our case as well that one atom somewhere close or within the middle of the array would detune from this EIT um, 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 resonance for the whole array. And here is my is my one huge, huge kind of influence of the Wittberg atom. And there is a new work um, also again in Emanuel Bloch's group together, the last author is actually Johannes Zeyer, who they haven't shown this superposition yet, but they can show that one can indeed kind of with one Wittberg atom get this in or out of resonance. And this can be um, used for example, um, for, 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 um, um, error correction or so, but I will I will um, not talk about that, um, and I will just kind of bring up my summary slide and um, be done with it. Okay, well, thanks for a great talk, Susanna. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, so a couple of questions actually about um, in an optical lattice, of course, if you don't have any interactions, then the atoms will be delocalized. They can just be in a superfluid yep. <laughs> uh, state. Um, so, how does would things change if they were if they're delocalized? And what that happens? That's an you go... excellent question, and one that we have kind of tried to avoid for the longest time. We always said, okay, let's assume um, they are um, the delocalization is not more than ten percent or so of the lattice constant. In which case, that works fine. Um, but this is, of course, an important question and becomes even more important for, for all kind of um, applications for which one, for example, needs a, a shallower lattice, or if we are looking at excitons, we get quite a bit of delocalization. So if delocalization would be completely incoherent, then this would make this mirror and everything considerably worse. Turns out that, that if we have a coherent superposition or coherent delocalization, which is usually the case, that is actually not a killer, um, but it changes things somewhat. And we are just working this on this, and I don't have pictures to show of that anymore. Um, it doesn't work for all kinds of parameters. And so you have to choose everything a little bit closer and carefully, but it still works. But Great. it is important that there is this coherence. So you still have to kind of keep the original symmetry. That is important. OK, maybe maybe one more question. Uh, so can you engineer collective dark states in these arrays so that you can store photonic excitations for long periods of time? Yes. <laughs> Um, and as you see in my summary slide, I have here a store and retrieve example, which I left out. So um, without somehow going through this whole thing, what you do is um, you can either store and retrieve via, via impurities. Um, but the better way is you kind of put, um, like, like in these pictures that I have here, these, these red and blue arrays, um, superimpose uh, uh, some kind of super lattice or so, which, which gives a little bit of the different detuning, for example, for this, for this red and blue pictures. And you can put kind of pretty much any pattern on this. Um, what this does is effectively makes the wave number of the, of the lattice smaller. And so if you, if you choose your, your, um, your pulse shape, right, which is actually not very complicated. So we have that in that paper as well. Um, 
you can with with close to 100% fidelity um, store and and retrieve single photons um, using these patterns for the storage and retrieval process. Um, what is more, you can that way also mix different K values and not just only store and retrieve, but also produce in principle single photon or low photon number kind of a coherent wave patterns of, um, in, of any kind of pattern that you choose. Great. Well, I think it's a great place to stop. So thanks once again for a really great talk. I'll clap on behalf of, of everybody in, in attendance. Um, and I'll just finish by uh, advertising our next uh, speaker in two weeks, who will be Pete Schmidt from PTB and uh, Leibniz University in, in Hanover. Um, so we hope to see everybody in the audience uh, then. And uh, thanks a lot again, Susanna. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'll be out there in a couple of weeks, actually. So uh, yeah, I exactly. I'm looking, looking forward. forward. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Let's see.